Welcome to Undercover Advocacy, How to Get Parents on Your Side. This is part of the Phys Ed Summit 2020, sponsored by Phys Edagogy. So my name is Jessica Monlex. I teach at Oak Manor Elementary School in Ukiah, California, up in Northern California. It is a K through six school, and I am the one credentialed phys ed teacher there. And I'm also a committee member of the K-8 Elementary Physical Education Workshop, EPEW, and is a summer conference that's put on. Some key things about me is I'm a mom of two kittens, keeps me pretty busy. I do competitive uh, trail riding on horses, and I do obstacle courses like the Tough Mudders and the Spartan races. And that's kind of come into play with some of the things that I do use for advocacy as well. Some things that you guys will get today is you'll be able to recognize why it's important to get parents on your side, explore ways to improve relationships with parents and communities. So a lot of people ask, why bother with this? So many teachers really do not see the benefit that parents and communities can bring to their programs. They just believe it's all about just their teaching and their students, their relationship with their students. Yes, that's important. But students are part of the community still. Their parents and the communities as a whole have a whole lot of, to do with them and can be pretty impactful with helping with your teaching. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. So my teaching situation, I see about 500 students a week. Uh, they all get phys ed four days a week for 30 minutes. However, I don't get to see all the students every day. For grades one through three, I get to see them one day a week. Uh, kindergartner in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, I get to see twice a week, so it's a little bit better. The days I do not have those students, paraprofessionals are running the classes with them and providing activities that I've planned for them. So I plan for 19 classes a day and I teach eight a day. So things get a little crazy. It's not ideal. It's I'm the only credential teacher there and so I'm spread pretty thin, and that's one of the things I'd really like to change. So my why for why I advocate so strongly for my program. My outdoor space is what I'm in all year round. Uh, if it's severely raining, we are forced to go inside with uh, the classroom teachers during their prep times. Otherwise, we're outside. So I have up to four classes at a time. And I have two large outdoor fields. Uh, one is has two medium-sized soccer fields on it and then another one <clears throat> which are irrigated the other large field is just mud and dead stuff it's not really cared for at all and so in the winter time or anytime it's wet which is about half the year for us I do not get to use those field spaces the only blacktop space I have is equivalent to about four basketball courts when you have four classes at once that can be a little problematic with spacing. So I'm really trying to get a track built. I'm calling it a track. The district likes to call it a dirt walking path uh, just because of the legal reasons or whatnot. <clears throat> so I'm trying to get that built. So I, my students have a space that we can use even when it's wet outside. Not necessarily when it's raining, but when it's wet outside. And that would allow me a whole lot more leeway with planning and stuff like that and with space. I'm also trying to change the phys ed policy at the district level. You saw in my teaching situation that it's not great. I don't get to see my students enough. I'm pretty limited with time. Only 30 minutes a day is not a lot. So I'm trying to get some of those things changed. I would like to have it be so it's just credential teachers teaching and not paraprofessionals. Um, there, there's a lot I'd like to change. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons I'm trying to get the community on my side so much. Districts will listen to parents and community um, much more quickly than just teachers. Teachers have a voice, parents and community have a much stronger voice is what I've discovered. I'm also trying to change the community view of phys ed. So many adults really think phys ed is the typical roll out the ball, the dodgeball every day. Um, they don't see it for the value of what we do. They don't see that we are the ones creating the community members as a whole. They don't see that we are making them the healthy lifelong individuals. And that's what I'm trying to change. <clears throat> so things that I do to help that. Uh, positive Contacts Home 
is huge. Bring your parent to PE week and an annual obstacle course that I use as a fundraiser as well. So for my positive contacts home, I got this first one from Terry Drain. She does positive emails home that she gets from a, what she calls the helping hand. So I've tweaked that a little bit because to me, I'm really trying to focus on change the verbiage of phys ed in that they learn when they come to me. So I now have students asking instead of like, what are we playing today? My students now ask, what are we, what are we learning today? I have made a learning culture in my class, which is fantastic. Worked really hard at that. And one way I did that is that we celebrate good learners in class. So every day I pick, every day I have them, I pick a random student and they have to say who they saw being a good learner in class. All this was gone over in detail at the beginning of the year. They do a whole brainstorming session is what makes a good learner? What does it sound like? What do you see? What does it look like? What does it feel like inside? What does it feel like when someone helps you with that? Um, so they, they know this, they know this well. And so once that student is recognized as being a good learner, they come up, um, I hand them the iPad, they put in their name, they put in their teacher's name and what they, exactly they were recognized for doing. Whether it be they were asking for help or they were actually following the directions or whatever part of being a good learner it was that they did, that's written in there. And what that does, that then triggers an email to be sent to the student themselves, the classroom teacher, and whatever um, adult guardian is in the system for them. And that gets sent directly home to them. So that requires no other work on my part. It's automatically sent to them, which has been fan a fantastic thing. So that means I do about two of those a day. So I'm sending home about 15 emails a day, the four days a week that I teach, um, about 15 emails a day of positive things to go home. The other major thing I do is positive phone calls home for students. If there's an improvement in behavior, if there's been a behavior problem before and we're able to turn that around, or um, increased effort if that was a problem before, most of these times I've already contacted parents about the issue. So then what happens is on a Friday, or I'll ask the student, what time of class on Friday would they like to get pulled from to be able to contact home? So I'll take them out of class. Uh, we will call home, we go into the principal's office, make a big deal there of this huge improvement, and then we call home together. So I speak to the adults, they get to speak to their parent, and then I speak again. Um, kind of go through like the huge improvement and exactly how I have the student actually say how they were able to do it and how that affected their learning in class. Um, so they, we practice it on the way there, like they get to look so good in front of their adults. They're beaming when they're talking about it. When they come back on Monday after those phone calls, um, I almost always hear about what an amazing weekend they were able to have because we made that phone call going into a weekend. Um, I hear back from parents quite a bit for those ones. I don't do them very often. It kind of takes a lot to be able to earn that from me and they know that, but the times that I've used it, it has been such a huge, huge improvement. Um, not just with the student themselves, because it helps help them keep that positive behavior or effort or whatever it is they're working on, helps them keep that. Because, And then it also helps that parent with their relationship with the school and with me as well. So if anything does come up again, we have this really positive note that makes them give even more to their student because of it. So here's some examples of what parents say when they get these things home back from us. Um, you know, a lot of glad they're doing a good job, excellence, all that kind of stuff. I've never once had any parent not be happy they received the phone call, and I've never heard anything negative about any of the emails. I just get pretty overwhelming. I get about 80% of the emails sent home get responses back um, of parents thinking it's pretty awesome that they get to hear it. <clears throat> so the other major thing I do is bring your parent to PE week. So this one I got from Will Potter and he started this over 10 years ago now. And what it is, it is the parents get to come and be students in my class with them, with their students. 
It is now promoted by active schools as the national advocacy movement for it. Um, I am a Title I school. We have very, very little parent involvement, very little parent involvement. And this is one of the biggest things. So I run the two biggest events on campus that get parents in the door. This and the optional course I'll be going over next. School-wide are the biggest parent draws. So this past year, I had over 85 parents attend. Um, I do not have it just as parents. I do have it uh, open to um, any family member, really over 18, neighbor, or friend, whatever. So here is one thing I do. Um, I create uh, quite a bit of hoopla around it. So this is the video that is pushed out um, at back to school night. So that is actually pushed out at back to school night. So when the principal meets with all of the parents there, that that is the it's premiered at that. It is played at back to school night in the classrooms for the parents to see again then. It is played in the classroom for the students to see because not all the students come to back to school night. And then it is also posted to our school Facebook page. It is posted to our school website and the district website as well. So things that um, I've learned that help make this even a much more special event is that if you have parents RSVP, it makes them feel really, really important. Um, if they know ahead of time exactly when they're coming and they've committed, I find that they're much more likely to show up. There is, becomes a much bigger deal. It's not just like, hey, I'll get, make it if I can it becomes, oh, I'm looking forward to this. It's something that's big enough of a deal that you need to plan ahead for. I have parents check in in the office and there's a checklist there in the office. So feedback I got from that one was that when first time I did that was parents were like, oh my goodness, it felt so official. I felt so important to go and they said, yep, you're on the list. You're good to go. Here's your badge. I created the name badges for all the parents beforehand. So when they got there, because they need to wear a visitor badge for us. A little sticker that says visitor and their name on it. So I actually went through and wrote all those out ahead of time. So when they got there, they checked in the office, their name was crossed off and they were handed their badge already. And it made parents feel really important and kind of, you know, like, oh, I this I, good thing I showed up kind of thing. Um, that it was all set up, taken care of, that they were handed things already. They didn't have to take the time to write it. I've been told that made them feel much more special than just like a normal coming to volunteer thing where you just kind of sign in and do everything yourself. It was, you're handed something to become officially part of it. Other thing I found that works great is if you teach the activities to the students first, they then get to become the helpers for the adults in the class. So for example, if I'm going to do um, a certain type of game, like I did, I believe last this past year I did Star Wars tag for the upper grade kids or some of the upper grade kids. And so students know the game first. They know the activity. They know our reason behind it. And that way, when we do discuss it, they have the answers. They help their, the adults through it. And they then get to be a little bit of like the teacher's helpers um, for the adults that come into class that don't 
that don't know the game yet, because clearly adults aren't going to know Star Wars tag. I think they should, but they, they don't. Also, to use the same procedures and have the same expectations for the adults as the students. Um, my, the adults that come to be students in my class during this week get no leeway. They have the exact same expectations as every single student in class. They're expected to know what procedures are. I'll kind of briefly go over them at the beginning, but I tell the students, if your adults are coming, you're responsible for teaching them. You have to make sure they know what it means when I start counting down from five. You have to know what, they have to know what it means when I say groups. All of those daily procedures and routines, they come knowing because I make a big deal about it to make sure the students teach their adults. And it really does give an amazing sense to the adults in that environment of like, this is what my student's experiencing. And it's a pretty good thing. Like they're learning just as much as the students are during that time. And it is an amazing thing to watch them learn alongside their students. It, it's, it's been a pretty awesome thing. Um, the other thing for this one is to make, I do the same exact routines. Like I have a whiteboard out with me that's the, has the what, why, how. We go over that at the beginning. So parents actually see what the students are learning, why they're learning it, and how they're going to know they've learned it. I use all the same language and we go through step by step, just like a normal day. We have our debrief at the end, just like normal. Um, we, I have peer assessment involved every time my class is built around that. They know all the, the vocab and the language to use for it, and they're helping their parents along with it. So their adults that are there are learning all that same skill set and seeing how advanced those students are with their communication skills in class. Um, I do also open up to not just parents, which is to me is super important. Not all parents are able to attend. I open it up to any person they want that's important to them that's at least 18. I do not let younger siblings come. It causes a lot of problems when they do. Some parents have not followed that rule and brought them anyways, and I've had to ask them to leave because it, it doesn't work. Um, older siblings, as long as they're 18, are more than welcome. I've had grandparents come, and even if they can't fully participate, they can still watch. They can still partake in what they can um, I also have had neighbors come, aunts and uncles. I had one student last year who brought five adults with them. I do not limit it to one. I say the more the, more the merrier, the more adults we can get out there, the better. And those classes are amazing. I have not ever had a single class without any adult come. I've had a few times with only one adult, um, but I've never had a class with no single adult come. Most of the time, the teachers choose to come out too for it, and they become the parent or the adult for those that can't have it. Um, and that is pretty fun, seeing the, the, the teachers out there with them. The students really do get a kick out of that as well, so that's pretty fun. So the last major thing I do is an obstacle course. So this is my one fundraiser I get a year. And this came about because when I was first hired, I was told I was in charge of the walkathon. I really do not like walkathons. I can't stand them. And I actually thought about not taking the job because of that. Decided that'd be really silly. It's, you know, I've I was went from um, really wanting an elementary job, and I you know I was able to get this one. So I wasn't going to turn it down because of that. But I also wanted to find a way to not have to do a walk up on. So the site secretary at the time had done Spartan races and I had done the Tough Mudders. And we got to talking and thinking how awesome it would be to be able to do that for our students. Something that we loved doing and that the kids have talked about. Like I talked about it with the kids, you know, and the students of what I'd done. And they all thought it was super awesome. And so we decided that that's what we were going to do. And we had a principal at the time who kind of like, do what you want. Like, don't keep me out of it if you can, but do what you want. And so he let us go ahead with that. And I really needed money for my program. I ha my budget, my yearly budget is $200 for everything. All equipment, everything. And that's not enough to run a phys ed program off of. 
So that's how this was born. And this is, um, I make a promo video every year for this. And this gets premiered at our open house. The obstacle course is done in May for us. And so this gets pushed out at our open house, which is combined with a big event that we do of Dia del Niño. So it's a huge um, community event where it's not just families that come, but the whole community comes and we do a big dinner. And this is premiered, which is pretty good a highlight. And we have performances put on by students as well. And then the classrooms open up after that. So this is how I premiere that one. So I do one of those videos every year for this one. Um, this past year, so spring of 2019, um, it, it grows a little bit every year. It was, I do two separate parts. Kinder through second grade does one part. And then once you get to third grade, it opens up the second half of the obstacle course. So younger kids had 18 obstacles this year. Upper grade kids had 24. Um, and it was pretty, pretty outstanding. So things to keep in mind if this is something you're interested in doing. You need to get as many volunteers as possible from parents and community. Um, I use about 55 volunteers in order to get this thing, in order to have it happen that day. That's just that day, not including all the prep work ahead of time. That day, it takes about 55 adults on, to be on board to help with this. Um, and mainly that's because our obstacles have gotten pretty elaborate as the years have gone by. I've done this four years now and some of the obstacles require like six adults to run it because uh, I've been able to get away with a little bit more each year. You need to have your district support. If I did not have the maintenance and grounds crews there with me at 6 a.m. to help set up, there is no way I could make this happen. They are there helping me, supporting me during the week ahead of time. They're helping make sure the fields are mowed. They're helping make sure that I've got stuff that I need. Um, and that day, they do a ton of the setup and a ton of the takedown with us. Parents are a huge involvement in that. I have parents that get there with me at 6 a.m. to start bucking hay bales. My first year, it was mainly just me for 60 straw bales, and that was pretty crazy. Um, and then a couple of them helped me during that time and then next year they're like hey uh, I'm, I'm doing hay again with you this year tell me when so I have parents that are there with me to set up that day at 6 a.m and by noon that day everything's taken down everything's put back to normal and everything's returned where we borrowed it from so it takes a lot of hands a lot of adults to help but that's also what builds that that relationship that's what builds the advocacy part of this is they see what we do for our students. They see what joy it brings to them and how hard we work for them. And it really gets them on your side. Um, other things I've learned is to have an equipment staging area where volunteers can easily access it. Uh, my first year doing this, we really didn't know what we were doing at all. We kind of, we put it together. It was, I think 19 obstacles for the upper grade kids, 12 for the younger kids. Um, and it was just all equipment that I had from PE. And so it was all in my storage unit. And I, we didn't, 
think of having it staged ahead of time. So when we got there at 6 a.m. to start setting up, I was doing straw bills, other people got there to help, and I didn't have the equipment out and staged, ready to go. I had to be digging through the ball shed to get everything out. Kind of had some stuff prepped a little bit, but I don't have a lot, I don't have extra space to stage things there. So what we've learned in the past now from that is we actually take the whole stage in the cafeteria and uh, have that be our staging area. So everything for uh, obstacle one is all set there and labeled. Obstacle two is all set there and labeled. So all of them are on the staging area. So I know ahead of time, the day beforehand, everything's there that they will need and they don't have to get into my storage space because stuff had gone missing that first year. That's all there ready to go. And that made a huge difference. Everyone checks in there and then gets what they need to go set up and goes to go do that. The other thing that makes a huge difference is we now make volunteer packets with setup and description. So if they're helping set up, uh, there's a packet that goes through uh, and has pictures and diagrams exactly how things are, how the obstacles are getting set up, whether it be spacing for lines or, you know, where the cones go or where the frisbees actually get put and where the line goes for what they need to throw past or whatnot. And it's all exactly detailed out. And that goes with all the equipment for them to set up. We walk out and we spray paint on the field or the blacktop, wherever it is, um, what station goes where. So it's all labeled. They have the cone number one, all the equipment for obstacle one. They walk it out there. They see the one painted on the ground because they follow the map they have and they set it up how it says. And that has been huge. That has freed me up to then make sure everything else is done. I don't have to go walking obstacle by obstacle by obstacle helping everyone set up. They've got that to, good to go. For the volunteers that are helping during the event, <clears throat> What they do get is they then get a packet that is just for their obstacle that says what their job is during the obstacle. For the straw bales, for example, it really is just stand on the side, make sure a child doesn't fall off the side of it. Pretty basic. For other ones like, um, I have one that, that was in the promo video of where they go over the steps while they're balancing stuff. In each grade, each grade span has a different challenge with it like how many things they have to balance and all that kind of stuff if it's on their head or they can use hand one hand two hands and so some of them are a little bit more detailed and others are just like stand aside make sure no one gets hurt that's it we have other we have slack lines that we get to do now and that is you know like how do you support a student to do that make sure you're not grabbing their hands make sure they're just grabbing your shoulder and all of that is detailed out to make it really easy for a volunteer, just grab what they need to, look at it and go to their station and kind of know what to do. We still go through and check everybody and make sure they understand, but that has been huge. I don't have to teach everything to every single person that gets there. I just check to make sure they understand. Much, much easier. So, so far I've done this four years and we've raised over $28,000. We have brought in a ton of community support, which has been fantastic. Uh, we make the front page of the paper every single year with a big old article and pictures and all that kind of stuff. So every time I see a student now during the summer, <laughs> first day of school, students are asking when it will be. First day of school, I can guarantee you at least 10 times I'm asked by students, when's the obstacle course? Um, because of everything going on in the world right now, we are not getting to do it this year, which is pretty heartbreaking. And that is the biggest comment I get from students about things now is that they're really upset they're not getting the obstacle course this year. They're all set for it next year. Parents now tell me to sign them up to help. I no longer have to make the endless phone calls searching for volunteers, hoping we have enough people to pull this off. I now am trying to find jobs for people because they want to come help so badly. And it's been great. So parents are now telling me like, I did this one last year, I wanna try something new. I, I did this one, I wanna do that again. I have these parents willing to come here at 6 a.m. to help me buck straw bales, which is not the most fun job in the world. And they plan their work days around that, around making sure they get to be this helpful part of this huge event. 
Um, I now also have parents and community members who are now helping create new obstacles. Um, we have a church down the road who we partner with for a lot of stuff. They've been a huge support to our school and their youth group now creates an obstacle every year. And so these students who are our students at school are now getting to be a part of creating these obstacles and it's been huge. We, at the end of the year, we do a debrief after it and students get to create ideas for possible obstacle course events or different obstacle course obstacles. And we've used some of them. Um, we've, we've added in a couple, some are like, hmm. Um, most of them are ideas that would be awesome. We just don't have a way of doing it yet. And this is what it is right now. My goal actually is that in a few years I can, because right now it's on a school day. It is on a Wednesday when we have our short days and first class starts going through at about 8.45. Everything is completely torn down, put away by noon. So we start our setup day at 6 a.m. So in six hours is this entire event. The only students and teachers are allowed to actually go through it. We have a lot of siblings that are really jealous. We have a lot of the parents and community members that help put this on, that really want to be able to go through it. They want to be part of it. And right now, there's not a way for that to happen. So I'm um, actually in talks right now with the district and the insurance and the lawyers and all that stuff to try to make it become a community event as a fundraiser and not just have it be for our students. So what we're looking at having it be now for hopefully next year is actually having different community partners create, build, and man the obstacle that day. So if someone wants to be in charge of the straw bills, if the feed store, we actually borrow all of the straw bills from them, pick it up the night before, keep it on the trailer under a tarp for the night. People get there at 6 a.m., start bucking it into the, into the pyramid formation. We use it, buck it back onto the trailer, return it to the feed store, and they take it all back. And we don't have to pay anything for it. So we're hoping that those kind of partnerships will actually, they'll send people over with it so that their business gets more recognition. We're now looking, we're looking at going to have it on a Saturday and it will become the community partners that are there. They're the ones creating, building, manning the obstacle. And then the school will do other parts of it. Um, we have a roofing company that's going to be helping out. We have the hospital who wants to be doing one. The sheriff's department always comes we get so much community support. We have, for volunteers every year, um, the hospital sends people, sheriff's department, uh, the fire department does, CHP, the police department. Um, we have several local businesses that also send people over, um, three of the construction companies in site in town also send people over to help stuff. Um, two of the tire places that donate our tires for when we, for the obstacles, they have people that come over to volunteer with us as well. And it's built this great relationship. And we're hoping to expand that even more in the future. Um, we're, we're adding more and more each year. It's still a work in progress. But so far from, I look back to the first year we did this, and we had no idea what we were doing. But it worked, you know, it got the community super involved and um, got us some money. It really built this excitement around phys ed for the first time ever in the school culture and community culture. It is not something that's thought of fondly here before. And thanks to these things, obstacle course in particular, uh, we're, we're changing the way that phys ed is viewed in the community. And it's been a pretty awesome thing to be a part of that and kind of be that force behind it. I mean, I have the city supervisor that comes to volunteer. The superintendent is there every year. Um, she's still, she doesn't like the fact that her kids can't th go through it. So she's helping kind of work out some of the other logistics for it because it is fun. It's so much fun to be a part of and to see the students joy as they do it. Um, one thing I would recommend if you are going to try this, 
take it easy on yourself. Um, reach out for lots of help. Make sure you plan things. Uh, if you're going to try any of these things, you should. Uh, the Bring Your Parent to Be You Week, there's tons of resources out there for it. And it, it really does make a difference for your students, for them to see that you are involved with the community and their parents. So if you're looking for resources, um, this is the bit.ly link for this presentation in my contact info there. It is always available for questions. Um, if you are interested in trying any of these things, I would love to help you on that, support you on that. Um, there is a lot of stuff that's gone into it. Um, if you want more information about any of these things in particular, I can share more stuff with you than just what's in this presentation. I could, I've several, since I started talking about this, um, I know a couple other phys ed teachers have done the obstacle courses and I've shared my entire documents with them of the obstacles I do, how they're set up, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I know it's been helpful for that. For the Bring Your Parent to PE Week, if you go to Active School's website, there's lots of stuff on there. And a lot of the teachers that do it are more than happy to talk to you about it and to kind of walk you through that. So yes, please reach out with any questions. And thanks for showing up.